believe they're in the truth. A, a false prophet is not running around the church thinking, I'm a false prophet deceiving people. They really believe they're in the truth. And, and um, the, the fear of God should come upon us because, you know, there's a story about Peter... And, you know, this Matthew 16, and, and, and Jesus asked the question, you know, who do people say I am? And they, they say, you're a prophet, a teacher, whatever. And, and then, well, who do you say I am? And Peter says, well, you are the Messiah, you're the son of the living God. And, and Jesus gets excited, and, and Jesus says, Peter, you received this revelation directly from the Father. You received this revelation from God, not from men. Men didn't teach you that. And he was rejoicing. Jesus is rejoicing. And upon this rock of revelation of who Christ is, I'm going to build a church that will conquer the gates of Hades. That's what Jesus said. It wasn't building a church on Peter. It's not building a church on Glenn or building a church on a man. It's the revelation of who Jesus is, the revelation of what Jesus is saying. That's how we build lives. That's how we build a church that conquers the gates of Hades. And then in the same conversation, Jesus is praising Peter in front of all the disciples. And Peter's probably going, oh, you hear that, guys? You know? and, uh, and then Jesus starts talking about the cross. And he starts talking about the suffering and the rejection that he is going to have to go through and the death of the cross. And Peter had in his worldview the glorious Christianity, total victory all the time and blessing, blessing, prosperity. And then as soon as he hears about suffering and sacrifice, Peter rebukes Jesus and says, this will never happen to you, Jesus. You know, here is someone rebuking Jesus. And you know what Jesus says to Peter? Who is denying suffering in the Christian experience. That's what it is. Get behind me, Satan. Here we have an apostle of Christ who receives pure revelation from the Father and in the same conversation now is deceived by Satan and he's speaking. Jesus said, this is the words of Satan himself you just declared to me. And if this can happen to Peter, it can happen to us. And this is where you need the fear of the Lord in the process because we all think that we're right. But we need the fear of the Lord to come before the Lord. Lord, is this you? Um, and that's why I say, especially the bigger issues, building accountability relationships with mature, discerning believers that we can talk through and pray through issues and not be an independent, spirited person. Um, it's very necessary. If it can happen to Peter, it can happen to us. Mm. Let's look at Psalm... 46 verse 10. One of the things I often do in my personal prayer time um, is I, I cry out to the Lord to... I said, Lord, if it's from you, empower me to proclaim your word. But Lord, help me discern when it's not from you and if it's from me. And Lord, shut my mouth if these words are not flowing from you. And, and, and protect me um, from you know, promoting deception. And, and so I'm praying that in the fear of the Lord because I know, like Peter, that I'm a human being. And we all need that, by the way. I want to really emphasize this point. Um, and I believe that if we've constantly got this attitude before the Lord of the fear of the Lord... And, uh, and, and, you know, constantly testing everything and, and praying over what it is that we feel that God's saying, um, it's a very healthy place to be. So we're in Psalms 46, verse 10. It says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Now, how is it that the Lord is exalted amongst the nations? What is it that leads to the Lord being exalted? What is it that leads to the Lord Almighty becoming our fortress, to become our protection? Be still and know I'm God. Um, in hearing God's voice, we've got to position ourselves in such a way that we can hear His voice. Um, when you're busy all the time, you know, because you can be busy uh, physically and you can be busy mentally. 
Because sometimes you're sitting down after you're working, but there's so many things going on in your life. And, and I get like this because I'm working on so many different projects and organising seminars and organising conferences. And, and I, I, we've got an intercessory prayer network. There's eight hubs that I'm overseeing, connecting all of those hubs and, and looking after Lions Roar. And then I've got a wife and kids and... Um, it's like so many things going on. So I can sit down at home and my mind is still busy, 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 busy. It's just constantly things are happening. And in that place of busyness, it's very hard for us to really hear the voice of God. Um, because what we're hearing is, the, is our own mind with all of our own responsibilities and worries and concerns. And that's filled up our mind. And what we've got to do is we've got to still ourselves. We've got to... So we've got to position ourselves. And, and so I want to talk a little bit about that, um, what it means to be still and know that He is God, to position ourselves to hear His voice, because there is no true prophet of God that is not first a listener. The prophetic gift is primarily not speaking, it's listening. And so we've got to position ourselves uh, in a place physically, emotionally, mentally, that we can more clearly hear what the Lord is saying. And, and so this will sometimes take, um, it's like a radio. Um, you know how you've got this radio and if it's not tuned in correctly, you get all the static. Mm. And as you're tuning in the radio, all you hear in the beginning is all the static. It's just uh, you know unhelpful noise. You can't dance to it, you can't sing to it. And... Uh, <laughs> And uh, you just hear this amazing static noise going on. But you tune in and you start to get tuned in to the place where you're going to get to that radio station. And so amongst the static, you start to hear the song. You start to hear the music or you start to hear the voice. In the static, it's there. It's kind of starting to break through. And then you go too far the other way and you got clearer and now it's gone again. And this is how it sometimes is with us trying to hear God's voice. Because we're instilling ourselves before the Lord. We've got to get rid of all of this static. All of these other thoughts. All of these worries. All of these concerns. All of these negative emotions that are running around. And, and they have a voice as well. And, um, and, and, and so you start. To, God starts to break through and then He disappears again. And He starts to break through and He disappears again. Um, but the more you tune in to that station, eventually you tune in and you get a clear message. Mm. Um, and so this is where we need to be in positioning ourselves. Um, and uh, that's why, you know, we start a service, we, we have praise and worship. Uh, praise and worship is really one of the ways that we start to tune out of all that's going on in the world, all that's going on in the workplace, all of the problems that it, we've, we're trying to tune out of that. And tune into God because praise and worship is focused upon Him and we're focusing off the other things. So that's one way that we tune in. And you can do this at home too. You learn to play some worship music and sit down and, and just worship along with the worship music for, and for a time. And it will start with a lot of static. You won't hear God break through straight away. You know... Uh, I've had times where I was able to break through in five minutes. I've had times where it was like half an hour to 40 minutes. Just that there was so much stuff happening in my life at that time. Um, but you, you press through till you hear. And, and that's the other reason why at Lions Raw we like to have uh, give a lot of time for worship. Prayer and worship. And uh, we have the night times where we're just waiting on the Lord and worshiping and praying. So we can be a people that are tuned in um, to the Lord. Very interesting story in the Old Testament. Uh, it's in the second book of Kings. The prophet uh, Elisha, uh, he was a student of Elijah. And you know, um, Elijah is one of the greatest prophets, and, and so was Elisha. And so, as prophets, they were very matured and very equipped in hearing God's voice and proclaiming it. They, they, were, they were gifted in discernment and um, they had a fame. They, they, they had the word of the Lord. So they would come to them and say, you've got the word of the Lord. You hear God's voice. Anyway, there was three kings they gathered. The king of Judah, the king of Israel, and another king. They gathered together to war against their enemies. And um, they had a word from the Lord to gather and fight against these enemies. And they went into 
the wilderness, um, but in the wilderness they got lost. And King Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, said to the king of Israel, it was Ahab's son, and Ahab is, as you know, notorious, the arch enemy of Elijah and Elisha is the, is the family of Ahab, the Jezebelic Ahab family line. Anyway, so Ahab and Jezebel's sons there as a king. Jehoshaphat, who's a righteous king, is there. And then there's other kings there. And um, Jehoshaphat says, look, we're lost. We're, you know, we're supposed to be going to war and we're, we're, we're going for the wilderness. And now everyone's starting to die of thirst. And even the camels are dying of thirst and the horses. And we're not in a good place here. Isn't there a prophet amongst us? Is there a prophet here? We need a prophet. We need the word of the Lord. Mm. And um, so, amazingly, amongst all of these warriors going through the wilderness, here is Elisha. Elisha must have had a word of the Lord to join them or something. He's following the army. And so, here is Ahab and Jezebel's son going, Yes, there is a prophet. You know, I don't really like him. He never prophesies good stuff about me. But there is a prophet called Elisha. And Jehoshaphat goes, Awesome. That's Elijah's, you know, apprentice. And he goes, Yeah. I'll bring him the spiritual son of Elijah. He has the word of the Lord. And so Elisha comes, and the three kings sit down, and they say to him, we need the word of the Lord. And Elisha looks at the son of Ahab and Jezebel, and, he, and he's just saying, he says, if it wasn't for Jehoshaphat, whom I honor, I wouldn't even look at your face. He was standing before the arch enemy of the prophets. The ones that had killed the prophets and, and killed the priests of God. And, and here he is, this unrighteous king that promotes Baal worship. You know? But then Jehoshaphat was a really holy, righteous king that promoted Yahweh worship. And he said, because of Jehoshaphat, I'm here. But he was emotionally in a place. Have you ever been like, you know, when, when someone has really hurt you or someone has really offended you or... Or, or, you know, someone is doing something that you know is just rotten and evil and you're just angry at them. You ever had those people in life? Am I the only one? Um, so how would Elisha have been in his emotional state? He's already just said, if it wasn't for Jehoshaphat, I wouldn't even look at you. He would have been negative in his emotions. He would, have, he would not have been emotionally in a place to be tuned into the heart of God. So Elisha says, bring me a musician. And the musician comes and the musician would have been playing worship music. And Elisha just starts to worship the Lord and worship the Lord until he tunes out of all of that negative emotion, out of all of that anger, out of all of that whatever it is, offense or whatever had come into the prophet's heart. He, he's worshipping the Lord and then he comes to a place, tuned into God and he starts prophesying and then it leads to victory. Um, just so you know, we understand even the prophets were men. James says that Elijah was a man just like us. They had some of these struggles that we go through. So tuning in the radio... Um, one of the things we need to do is Jesus' ministry is really busy at one time and they fed the 5,000 and they've done this and raised the dead and, and it's just busy, busy, busy and the more miracles Jesus did, it's like the more people came. You know, thousands of people need to get ministered to and I get tired if I have to pray for like 50 people and he was getting thousands of people and his disciples were ministering to all these people all the time and then Jesus one day turned around to his disciples and he says, come alongside with me to a quiet place. He realized he had to get out of the business of ministry. He had to come alongside to a quiet place and just before the Lord. In other words, for him to tune into God afresh, he had to come out of all of that busyness and, 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 and in the natural find a place that was quiet. I was talking to one uh, when I was a missionary, uh, one missionary lady, and we were talking about quiet times. And she said, do you know what my definition of a quiet time is? And I said, oh, what's your definition of a quiet time? And she said, that's what happened before I, had married, uh, before I got married and had children. Because after you got children, they're trying to find a quiet time. It's like, oh. you know, it's, it's, and she, she said, my other definition of quiet time is when I go to the toilet and lock the door. <laughs> um, so 
It's not easy to find a quiet time in the busyness of life. And especially you know, uh, for, for mums at home with lots of kids. For, I work at a home office with a wife who likes talking. And lots of kids who like talking. And, and so it's, it's very hard to get quiet times because it's always, Glenny, Glenny, you know, breaking into, I'm in the third heaven, meeting you, Glenny, come here, I need your help. So I go out, I do prayer walks, you know, and I don't take my phone. Um, lest I get, Glenny. The distractions, you know, as the enemy stirs my wife up against me. <laughs> Um, but, but this is the first thing, to find a quiet place and to make a quiet time. Um, one thing my wife does is she gets up 4.30 a.m. in the morning and everyone's asleep. The kids wake up about 5.30. So. Um, but find, find that quiet place. Um, for me, I have to get out. And I find it very hard to just really pray at home because I work at home. I've got wife and kids at home. And it's, that's my busy place and it's just like... I'm sick of this building. I, I like to get out. And sometimes I turn up here and open up the prayer room an hour early and just walk around the prayer room by myself and just spend quiet time before the Lord. I go for bush walks up in the, this forest around here. It's awesome. I went for two hours one day, didn't see a person. Um, but these are things that we need to do to position ourselves to hear God's voice. Um, When you come into that quiet place, um, grab the Bible. You know, you can read the Bible and you can memorize the Bible and not ever hear from God. The Pharisees did that. They memorized the whole thing, didn't know God when he was standing in front of them. The living Bible was there, you know. That's a true living Bible, Jesus. Um, when we get the Bible and we have a devotion time or a quiet time, it's relational. You need to relationally involve God in what you're doing. You need to speak to him. You need to invite him to come and speak to you through the story. Um, you need to say, okay, Lord, what is it that you're saying to me through this? You need to open your spiritual ears. Um, by faith, actively do these things as opposed to get up in the morning, oh, I'm going to do a 10-minute devotion, I'll read the Bible for 10 minutes, you know. And usually, you know, if you're anything like me, first in the morning reading the Bible, I've got blurry letters, blurry letters, blurry letters, Jesus, blurry letters, God, the Father. Uh, but, you know... There, there is this active relational thing in reading the Word of God. Powerful thing. You know, Jesus himself is the Logos. He's not Rhema. That's what John, chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was God, the Word was with God, and by Him all things were created. Well, that's Logos, not Rhema. Mm -hmm. And we've got the Logos, Jesus, and then suddenly the Spirit of God came upon the Logos, and then it became the living and active revelation. And so we've got the Logos word here because people saw Jesus, the Logos, and didn't get revelation until the Spirit of God came upon them and then through Jesus they got revelation. You understand what I'm saying? Jesus was speaking. Now Jesus, the Son of God himself, and these guys are getting nothing. The Pharisees are there, you know, in one ear, out the other. But then there's people who had hearts of faith. What had happened is they positioned themselves by faith to hear God's voice. Whereas the Pharisees didn't position themselves by faith they didn't really want to hear. They'd already determined in their heart who God is and what God's saying, and this isn't it. Um, that's why the voice of your own opinion can be the greatest hindrance to hearing God's voice, because you're already predetermined what God wants to do. Um, and so one of the things you do need to do, by the way, in positioning yourself, is silence the voice of your own opinion. And you can do this by praying. Lord, I come before you this day... And I bring before you my own thoughts and my own opinions about what I am to do in life or how I am to pray or what I... And I, I put that all on the altar right now and I ask for the help of your Holy Spirit to do this because I can't even do this without your Holy Spirit. But I put my opinions and my thoughts on the altar and I ask that you would speak to me. That is a prayer that you need to regularly pray recognize that's why I'm praying God let it be from you and let it not be from me God and protect me from myself and promoting my own agenda um, another prayer you do as you come into this place to position yourself is to silence the voice of the enemy because he still does speak and even for mature Christians <clears throat> the thing is if the voice of the enemy has agreement 
with the voice of your own desire, the enemy can deceive you through the voice of your own desire. You see how that works? That's why, that's why most temptation works. Satan sees what's your desire, what's your sinful desire, what's the pride of your heart, and then he will speak in agreement with the pride of your heart to encourage you in that direction. Um, so you, you pray a prayer, Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name I take authority and I silence the voice of the enemy. I cleanse myself from the voice of the enemy. And then the next prayer is, Lord, open my ears by your Holy Spirit that I'd hear and discern your voice clearly. Mm. So you actively pray those sort of prayers, even when you're reading the Word of God. Lord God, I've read this passage before. I've read it a hundred times. I've heard it preached a hundred times. But Lord, I put all that aside. I ask that you speak to me fresh today. Um, th these are all ways of positioning ourselves. When you read Scripture... Read it in a meditative type attitude, which uh, we're not talking. The word meditation is ancient Hebrew. They've got it. The Hebrews used to meditate. The prophets meditated. It's not all New Age stuff. They're just The New Age way of doing it is different. Um, the way that they would meditate biblically, the prophets, is they get the scripture and they meditate upon the scripture. And they meditate upon the words of scripture by faith. Crying out, God, speak to me. Give me revelation. And they'd go over the passage and they'd write down the passage and they'd sing the passage and, and they'd pray out the passage and they'd write it down and read it again. This is how you meditate on the Word of God. Now, Eastern meditation, I, I was involved with the New Age and all that stuff before I got saved. And I was a, a missionary amongst Tibetan Buddhist people, so I've studied what is, you know, um, tantric meditation and all that stuff. That was I, I was opposing that, but... I know what it is. And the whole key of Eastern meditation is empty yourself of yourself. 